In today's video, we are going to discuss everything you will need to know if you're considering selling your property this year. And even if you are not considering selling your property this year, I think you're going to find this video pretty interesting because what I wanted to do here is basically have a one on one conversation with you, just you and just me. And these are conversations I have on a weekly basis with our clients, with our sellers. And I want to show you everything that you would possibly need to know if you're going to consider to sell your property. So whether you have a condo, a freehold, a townhouse, it doesn't matter. We're going to cover everything in today's video. And I'm going to pull back the curtain. We're going to talk about everything. We're talking about commission, the different models you can choose when selling a home, the types of pricing strategies that are working best in today's market and everything in between. So sit back, relax. Let's go through everything together. I'm also going to put chapters down below so you can jump around this video if there's one specific thing you want to learn. And if you have any questions at all, please, please, please put them in the comments below and I will make sure to answer them for you. Just before we get into this video, I want to introduce myself again. My name is Tom Story. I run a real estate team here in the city of Toronto. We sell over 100 homes a year and my primary job on my team is talking with sellers and listing properties. So this is something that I have a lot of experience in and all the advice I'm gonna give you in today's video is based on things that I know are working. Not that I think are working or might work, but that I've actually seen the data to back it up. If you learned something new in this video, all I ask is you hit subscribe and join our growing community. Also give this video a big fat like if you do that, the algorithm will show it to other awesome people like you. And corny sales pitch coming in three, two, one. If you watch this video and you did learn something new and you want to contact me to sell your property in Toronto, you can go into the first link in the description. I also just put out the ultimate condo buyer's guide. So that video already exists. I'll link it below and also stay tuned because I'm going to put out another similar video like this. That's going to talk about everything you need to know if you're looking to buy a house this year. I found over the years that when I meet with sellers, there's essentially five questions that they want answered. So whether we talk for five minutes or five hours for them to make the best decision for them being educated on their decision, there's five things they want answered. The first question is, well, why should I hire a specific person? So I'll go over the models that exist and what your options are in today's market. The second question is, well, what's going on in the market? So we're going to talk about the numbers that you're going to need to know the fundamentals of the market that will help you best strategize on how to get the most amount of money for your property. The third question is usually how will the property be marketed? Do open houses still work? And we'll talk about that in today's video. Question number four is, well, what is my property worth? So we're going to go over all the things that you would need to know to figure out what your property is actually worth. Also talking about pricing strategies that work best in today's market. And the fifth question is, well, what's the charge? What is your fee for service? What does a real estate agent actually charge you? What are they doing for the money that they are charging you and how do they get paid? Okay, let's get started with the first question I ask every single seller when I meet with them is, why are you selling your property, right? And sometimes the reasons will be, well, we want to upsize or, you know, unfortunate reasons because people are getting separated and, and all those type of things. But if you're thinking about doing this, like actually really break it down, like why are you doing this? Because it's not going to be cheap, like moving is a headache, right? There's all these things you need to be aware of. So make sure that you really, 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 truly understand why you're selling the property. And if the money's just going to sit in a high interest savings account, and that's something that you're comfortable with, by all means, go for it. But just be very, very clear on why you are actually selling. Don't just sell your property because you read one news headline that you didn't like, or your neighbor down the street who hasn't sold the property in 20 years is saying the market's going to crash. Like they're going to be right at some point, right? Typically once every seven years, we have cycles in the market, but just be really, really clear on why you're actually selling the property. Now we're going to talk about all the fees associated with selling a home in today's video. But the one that a lot of people don't think about until it's too late is the penalty to break the mortgage, right? So if you have a fixed rate mortgage, typically if you sell a property and you're not going to be porting that mortgage elsewhere, you're paying a fee. The first thing you should do if you are thinking of selling a property is reach out to your mortgage broker or your bank, depending on where you got that product from and ask them based on the term left on my mortgage, what would be the penalty if I were to sell my property? If you have a variable rate, for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. It is three months interest for most of those products. But again, just triple check, talk with your bank, talk with your mortgage broker and see what the fee is going to be. Okay, so now you've decided that you want to sell your property. 
you're aware of what your mortgage penalty is going to be if you do have a mortgage. Now you have to choose, well, what type of service are you looking for? And really, and this isn't something that a lot of like full service realtors will talk about, but like, let's let's be clear here, right? Let's Let's break it all down. You have three different options. Let's go over all three options. Option number one is there are companies that you can pay a flat fee to, so you pay them. It can be like a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks. Some of them will differ. And for that fee that you pay up front, they will put your property onto the MLS. Now, this is something in the industry that we call a near posting. So what that means is that the property goes onto the MLS, but that service, all you're really paying for is getting onto the system. And then you are essentially selling your property on your own and you are negotiating with another agent on the other side representing the buyer. Now, that is an option that you have to you. It is a very low fee option, but you're doing all the work. If you feel like you are educated enough and have the time to sell your property this way, by all means, I'm not here to talk you out of it. But I wanna be very clear that you absolutely have that option if that's something that you want to choose and get onto the system. There is a company that was doing it in Toronto called Fairsquare that used to be called Purple Bricks. They actually just shut down their operations. There is other alternatives that exist out there. I'd say in the city of Toronto, these type of listings represent less than 1% of the market, but it is something that we do see out there. Now, the second option you have is something that we would probably call like the discount real estate agent, right? Where their main value proposition is purely just that they charge less, right? Maybe they're not the best at negotiating. Maybe they're only selling two or three properties a year, but on the surface level, they charge less. And to you, that looks pretty good, right? Now, in these scenarios, typically the overall commission in which they will charge you uh, will be lower than a full service agent, but it's also just because they're investing less into your property. So typically with these type of realtors, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with this, right? There's a business model for everybody, for both consumers and business owners. But these type of realtors, yeah, they'll get photos taken of your property, but they're probably not going to spend a lot of money on marketing. Rarely are they ever going to pay for the staging of the property because that's a big, big expense that full service realtors kind of take care of. And in this scenario, they just have less skin in the game, right? So if the property doesn't sell, it's okay. They really just spent money on photos. And if it does sell, okay, it's great. And that makes sense to them. Now, these type of realtors work for every single brand. I'm not going to say specific brands in this video, but they exist across the board. Just make sure they actually know what they're doing. Okay. Having a real estate license and being actually a well-qualified, good real estate agent that's good at negotiating and going to do the best job for their clients, in my opinion, are two very separate things. I had heard a long time ago that about 70% of people will buy things based on value. So, you know, you buy the winter jacket, it's going to last you five years, but it's a bit more expensive versus 30% of the population are going to buy strictly based on price. And again, there is nothing wrong with either way you go here. The third option is the full service real estate agent. So that is the category that myself and my team fall into. And I decided to be this type of model for one very specific reason. When I got my real estate license 10 years ago, I was clear that this was going to be my career. You guys can probably tell if you've been watching my content, like I'm borderline obsessed with this, right? I really, really love what I do. I don't do this just on the weekends. I don't have another job. This is what I do. I run a business. I employ other people. I have expenses. And because of that, we've decided to create a full service atmosphere because 90% of our business every year has been repeat and referral. And I know if I'm willing to invest into my client's property to get them the best result, that is the most important. And that takes us into the third category of the full service realtor. Now, the full service realtor, depending on market, we can go over what the commissions would potentially be. Now, there are two sides to the commission. Half typically goes to the agent that represents the buyer and half goes to the agent that is representing the seller. Now, in some cases, some agents will say, well, if I'm representing you over here, this is my commission here, and this is the commission going to the buyer's agent. But if I can find the buyer, I'll actually make that less and, and charge you a, a smaller overall commission. That's called a collateral agreement before you go to the market. Now, in my opinion, I've always had a rule on my team that if a seller is hiring me, I'm only ever working for them. I will never ever personally myself represent a buyer on one of my own listings because I think it's unethical. It's already been banned in BC. Now, to say that in smaller markets, sometimes where there's not a lot of realtors, this is just something that's going to happen. But in big markets like Toronto, I don't think we have to deal with it. It just doesn't feel right to me. So in the city of Toronto, a full service realtor typically is charging you 5%. However, this is how it's going to be broken down. 
2.5% is going towards what they are actually charging you. That's what the brokerage is earning off the sale of your property. And the other 2.5% is going to the realtor that is representing the buyer. So 2.5, 2.5, but totals to be 5%. And there is HST on that 5% because we are a service. Obviously, that money goes to the government through taxes. But that's something a lot of people don't say up front that I think we need to be very, very clear on. There's absolutely HST on agent fees. Now, here's the difference, right? Other than the things that you can't see, which is just experience, negotiation skills, you don't see that till the moment it happens. There's other things that we're doing on the full service category of our business. I can go over a few. And by the way, this isn't just me like this. I hope this doesn't feel like a sales pitch for my business. This is what lots of great real estate agents do. So the big one is staging, right? To stage a property, a house in Toronto, $7,500. I pay that out of pocket. I don't spend money because I love spending money for no reason. Visually, because we live in this HGTV world, staging is making a huge impact. The second thing is the team that helps prepare the property, right? So I have a full-time client care coordinator and so do many other top agents in the city of Toronto and they will take care of everything you could possibly think of, right? So it's not a one man, one woman operation. I have a team of people in place that have specific jobs to do specific tasks. Now on top of that, the marketing, the photos, and I can go over this in detail with you if you actually want to book a call with me, but the way that you are going to present your property, you should be proud when it hits the market. I tell buyers all the time, if you see a house with crappy iPhone photos, go after that one because they're not marketing it correctly. Let's go get a deal. But if you're a seller, you got to do everything in your power to make your home look amazing, especially in markets where not everything is selling. You have to look better than the competition. Okay, so just to recap, you can do a mere posting where you pay up front regardless if the property sells or not. You can do a discount agent or you can do full service. Now, the number one question I ask all sellers is what is more important to you? The amount of money in which you are paying or the amount of money left in your bank account at the end of the day. So beans in your jeans is a funny analogy that a seller said to me once. He's like, I want the most amount of beans in my jeans. I'm like, if that's what you want, then let me invest a bunch of money into your property to get you the best possible price. But that is a decision that you as a potential seller have to decide what makes most amount of sense for you. There's also a few specific questions questions you could ask a real estate agent when you are interviewing them, right? Um, the one that people actually ask the most, but I think doesn't actually mean the most is, well, how long have you been doing this? And they equate years in business to experience. But I know agents that have been in the business for five years that have sold more properties than people that have been in the business for 30 years. So it's more like, well, what have you actually accomplished in your time in the business? Now, that's one we hear all the time, but I think if you're gonna break it down even further, it's the first question which would be, well, how many properties do you sell every year? Pretty straightforward, right? The average realtor in Toronto, by the way, is three. So, you know, if they're doing over 15 or over 30, they're actually technically in the top 1% of the city. The second question would be for of those homes that you sell, the listings that you sell, what is your list price to sale price ratio? Meaning, you know, if you listed the property, but you sell them all at a low discount, that's not a great agent you want to pick. But if they're getting at least asking price or more for the average of their listing, that's someone that's probably investing into their client's properties. The next question would be, what is your average days on market for the properties that you are listing? And now you want to take their days on market and put it up against the average days on market in your area that you're looking to sell in as well. And the last question is pretty straightforward, but what percentage of the properties that you list do you actually sell, right? Someone could take 100 listings a year, but if they only sell 10 of them, that's not that great, right? You're going to want a realtor that's doing over at least minimum 80% of their listings are actually selling, ideally over 90%. If it is lower than the market average, that's probably not a realtor you want to hire. The next topic we're going to talk about, and here's the numbers that you're going to need to know, okay? So there's a few kind of basic things you need to know. Now, I can show you exactly how to find these for your market. In Toronto, you type in TREB market stats and you get the updated and you go to your area and you look for these numbers, right? So here's what you're gonna to want to know. The first one is months of inventory for your property type. If you've been watching this channel for a period of time, you're gonna be like, Tom's talking about months of inventory again. Yes, but it is the best way, the absolute best way to understand what a market is doing. It's the absorption rate of inventory on the market and how quick properties are actually selling. So what you're gonna do for your area in the last 30 days is you're gonna take how many active listings are currently on the market that match your property type and divide it by how many properties sold in that last 30 days. Now, if you don't have enough data and there's only like 
five active listings and two sales. Go back and do a three to six months rolling average in terms of what that's going to be. So you take active listings, you divide it by sales, and it gives you a number. Now, anything under the number three is fundamentally a seller's market. So three months of inventory means one out of every three new properties that list in that 30-day period is going to sell, a 33% success rate. As you keep going up from there, you have more inventory on the market. So three months of inventory is a regular, kind of healthy seller's market. Two months of inventory is a hot seller's market. Under one month of inventory is absolute insanity where you see everything selling over ask. Now in the other direction, if you have four to six months of inventory, that is a balanced out market where you typically don't see price growth or price decline because the amount of buyers versus the amount of sellers actually is equaling out. And then if you go over five, six, seven, eight months of inventory, that is when you're getting into buyer market territory. Now, we have not entered that territory for long periods of time in Toronto for honestly like over 20 years and in certain pockets and, and luxury high end stuff, of course it happens. But for the general market in Toronto, we're typically usually in the seller's market category, depending on what's happening with rate hikes or new regulations. We, we go into balance once in a while as well. But overall, we have had an inventory issue in the city of Toronto. Okay, so months of inventory is the first thing you need to know for your property type in the area that you are. The general market stats are not going to be helpful for you on this. You need to go micro market and figure it out. And like I said, I can show you exactly how to do this. The second thing you're going to want to know is the average list price versus sale price ratio. So of the amount of properties that actually sold in the last 30 days, did they get asking price? Did they get 99%? Did they get 98%? Did they get 105%, right? Like take a look at that and figure out because that will show you what is happening specifically in your market. Are properties selling for what they're asking for? Are they going under or are they going over? Now, the last number is days on market. Keep in mind that days on market only tracks the properties that actually sold. So if you have two months of inventory, that means one out of every two new listings is selling in a 30 day period. 50% of the properties are selling. So if we then go, okay, let's say 45 properties sold that month. Okay, so of the 45 properties that sold, the average days on market was, let's say, 17. All that number means to you is that if your property has been on the market for over 17 days and you haven't received an offer, it's likely that the market is not agreeing with your pricing strategy. Because what the data is telling us is that if the property was priced correctly, you should have received an offer by now. That's not my opinion. That's literally the market talking to you saying like, hey, the numbers are not adding up here. And that's when you have to decide if you want to adjust your strategy. In part two of this video, we're gonna talk about marketing your property. Let's jump into it. The more exposure your home gets, the more eyeballs on your property, the better chance you have of selling your property for a price that you are happy with. Now, any realtor that has a real estate license can put your property onto the MLS system. When it goes onto the MLS system in Canada, the main website it goes to is realtor.ca and then it funnels down to every other third party website that you know of or anything you've seen a listing on, it's all funneling from the realtor.ca, which is coming from the MLS system. Now, in my opinion, there is no skill to putting a property on MLS. If you have a real estate license, you can do it. Now, the reality is that that is still where most people are going to see the property and that's why you have to stage it. You have to make the photos look amazing. You have to make even so so much as like that first photo on the listing, make it like amaze, show the best feature of the house. Like don't just put some random picture of the outside of the house. Like if you have an amazing living area, that should be the thing that grabs people's attention because otherwise they're jumping to the next listing. And then the pricing strategy as well, which we'll get to in the next few minutes. So being on the system is obviously the most important. You all will have access to do that. But what else exists out there, right? So you can look at a few different things. There's print marketing, sending flyers to different areas. A lot of agents will actually still put their listings in the newspaper, but that's more on a kind of high end, more mature demographic that's actually seeing that. So it depends on the area. But then you got to look right now at social media. So where are the eyeballs? Now, what I found, which is kind of interesting, is that to get additional exposure, you have to think of like, not just who's going to buy the property, but who are they working with, right? So likely they're working with another real estate agent. And what I found interesting from our Instagram account is we have like 14,000 people following us. But 
I have a big following of other real estate agents. Like I'd say probably 10,000 of those 14,000 on that account are other realtors because I do the media stuff and public speaking, right? Which has been cool. But what I found is when I post an Instagram story saying like, hey, I have this house coming in this area next week. Send me a, a DM if you have any questions. I'm getting like 10 DMs from other agents saying like, hey, like I might have a client for that. Can we get in there early or when are you taking offers or what's the deal with this one? So you're creating more exposure before it ever hits the market. I will say that I think 99.9% .9 of the time you should not be selling your home exclusively. You should be going to the MLS unless someone gives you an offer that you absolutely just can't refuse. But that's something as well where if, if the agent you're talking to as something other than just the MLS, where they can get more eyeballs and maybe they get you three more showings and one more offer and even just $5,000 more on the sale price. If they're doing something that other people don't have access to, that's where I think the value lies. Now, what else could that be? Well, it could just even be that in their office meeting, they talk about your house and it helps get more people interested in telling their clients about it. It means that they're picking up their phone and going old school and calling their past clients saying, hey, I got this new listing coming up in this area. Is this something that could work for you? And if not, do you know anybody that this could potentially work for? Also having email lists, this is a big thing. A lot of the top realtors in this city will have email lists where they'll blast out their listings to everybody. Truthfully, I unsubscribe from most of those because it's annoying, like just to be honest. Um, but that is something that a lot of people will say, well, I have this list of people that nobody else has and that's important. Other than just, you know, the for sale sign, which everyone does and going on MLS that everybody does. Ask people what else they are doing to market your property and whether that's running Facebook ads, Instagram ads, you know, posting your property video tours on YouTube, things like that. Just ask them what they're doing and see how they're standing out in the marketplace. The next part of marketing is what I think is actually the most important thing when you sell your property in the city of Toronto is staging. Like staging works. That's all I can say about it. You know, I've been doing it for so long. I It's probably my biggest expense every single year. A lot of top realtors will pay for the staging of their clients' properties. We do it because it works. The properties look better. The buyers walk into them and think, wow, this could be my home, not I'm just walking into somebody else's home. Staging isn't necessarily how you live in the property, but it's how to make the property look as big, as bright, as beautiful as it possibly can during the time that it's for sale. So it's like maybe the couch isn't set up in the way that you can perfectly see the TV, but it's going to be set up in the way that makes the space look the most functional for that potential buyer. Staging is so, so important. Now, do I think everyone needs to stage their property? Not everybody, but I think you should seriously consider it if you are going to go to the market. Some people already have like impeccable design and taste where they don't really need to do anything to their house. But a lot of people could use a third perspective. You know, we bring in a third party staging company. Some realtors have it in house. It's all kind of the same, right? As long as they know what they're doing, they get in there and they make it look really good. In my experience, it is absolutely worth it 100% of the time. Now, other than exposure, staging. Now we have to talk about pricing strategy for your property. Now there's a few key things you have to look at when you're trying to figure out what your property is worth, right? So let's talk about houses first. With a house, obviously you're going to start at the top. You're going to say, okay, this has to be located in this location. So a recent sale in the same area that I am located in. The second thing I will then personally look at is what were the taxes of the house that recently sold and what are your taxes? Now this isn't like a perfect science, but it gives you a pretty good indication of like, if their taxes were $200 more, it's a pretty similar property, at least in the eyes of the city. As you keep going down the list for a house, you have to look at lot size, lot width, and lot depth. Now, lot width, I would say, is more important than depth. Obviously, both are important. So if your house is a semi-attached house that's 20 feet wide by 100 deep, and you're comparing your house to another semi that's 25 feet wide and 110 deep, no, that house is probably going to be worth more money because it is more land. It is more lot. And what you're essentially buying in Toronto is the land. The house just happens to be on it. And that's what you're actually going to live in. So lot size is very, very important. Then you're going to go to, okay, Okay, how many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? Does it have parking? And if it has parking, is it a garage? Is it alleyway parking? You're going to go through all these different things. Now, basement. Is the basement finished? Is it unfinished? Does it have a separate entrance? Like, I could probably, if you guys are interested, let me know below. I can send you like a sheet of all the main things you would need to know when valuing your property versus another property. And then once you get through all of that, the things that you can't really change or the main parts of the house, then you go to, okay, was the kitchen renovated? 
right? Does the upstairs have an ensuite bathroom in this house and it didn't have it in this house? So that's what you would do to actually price a property. You look at all the recent sales when they happen and that's what your realtor will do with you when they sit down with you to help price your property. If you're selling a condo, it's pretty similar, right? So first you wanna look in the same building you're in. Nothing's gonna be better than the building that you're actually in. Don't cherry pick another building across the street that's newer than yours and say, well, mine's worth that. It's probably not worth that, right? You have to look in your building. Condos are easier to price, to be honest with you. I, I'd say you're looking at price per square foot, right? What level is it on? Typically, condos is $1,000 per floor going up. The reason for that is that when these properties sold pre-construction, that is how they sold as well. So it was a premium $1,000 per floor. And then other things for condos to think about are obviously view functional floor plans. Does it have a locker? Does it have parking? We can do all these numbers for you, but that's what you're going to have to think about. And once you have an idea of what your property is worth, you have to decide what strategy are you going to take? Now, there are two common strategies used in Toronto. Strategy number one, we call offers anytime. This is when you prepare your property for sale, you put it on the market and the price in which you listed your property at, that is indeed the price you actually want. Pretty straightforward, right? Most people would love that this is just how the market always worked, but it's not always the reality in Toronto. When you do this, you're saying to the market, hey guys, here it is. This is what I'm looking for. Come see the property, send me an offer, right? Pretty straightforward. Now, the other strategy, which has caused a lot of contention, especially with consumers, is the marketing price strategy. So let's break that down and go over why as a seller, although I fully recognize that buyers absolutely hate it, why as a seller it may actually help you get the most amount of money. Now a marketing price strategy, let's say on the surface the home is worth a million dollars. You could list it at a million dollars and you might get a million dollars, but if you could list it at eight ninety nine. Get as many people through that property as possible. Have an offer date the following week. Review all the offers and emotions kick in and buyers are battling against each other and the home sells for a million thirty thousand. You just made yourself $30,000 more potentially, right? This doesn't always happen all the time and offer dates don't always work. If they don't work, they then relist at their real price. Now, this type of strategy only works in my opinion, that I see when there's under two months of inventory in your area. So if there's 50 other homes or condos identical to yours, this strategy is not going to work. Like this strategy doesn't work in markets where there's more inventory. It only works when there's tight inventory and buyers don't have a lot to choose from. Now, there's a lot of talk that even if people listed low and held offer dates, well, at some point, the government just going to outright uh, ban blind bidding and we're going to make it open bidding. Um, I actually don't really think it matters. Honestly, I think if they did open bidding, the results would be pretty much the same or everyone would just go in with their first offer being low and then wait till the next offer to actually put it up. So it's almost blind bidding again because you're all faking out what your first offer is going to be anyways. I think at the end of the day here, it's always going to be an inventory issue, but I'm going on a rant. That is for another video. The next thing you're going to need to know on the marketing side of selling your property is, well, who's actually going to buy your property, right? What's the ideal buyer kind of template? Who's that person going to be that's typically going to buy your type of property, right? Let's say, for example, you've got a $600,000 condo in downtown Toronto. Who's buying that? Probably a first-time buyer or first-time home buyer, but dual income, right? So two people, both have income, they can afford to buy that as their first property. It could be an investor or maybe even, you know, someone downsizing from a bigger property or someone that, you know, unfortunately maybe went through a divorce or something like that that just needs something smaller to move into in the same area as the school district of their kids or something like that. But here's where I actually want you to focus your attention here. Okay, what you're going to have to look at and you can do this by going to the Toronto Real Estate Board stats and numbers every single year. And you can take a look on the categories. And again, even if you want to comment below and just tell me like price range, uh, what you think your property is worth and area it is, I can tell you what percentage of buyers actually exist. So what you need to know is what sandbox are you playing in? Like, for instance, if you're trying to sell a condo over $2 million, you're dealing with 6% of all the condo buyers. You're dealing with a small pool of buyers. Where if you're trying to sell a condo between 500 and 600,000, you're dealing with like 40% of the buyers. You've got a massive pool of buyers. If you're trying to sell a home over a certain price point. So what I'm getting at here is that you need to know, well, who's that buyer? Who's actually gonna buy the property? How many of those people actually exist? that can afford to buy your property. And then of those people, 
what percentage are actually maybe going to be interested in buying your property that are going to then see your property and then maybe make an offer. So I think being very clear on those numbers uh, is a good thing to do. And your real estate agent can break those numbers down for you based on the market stat. Now, at this point in the video, we've talked about kind of everything education wise of getting yourself to the point that, you know, you know what your property is worth. You've talked to your real estate agent, you're preparing your property for the market. You've decided on the strategy in which you want to take to price your property. And that's all kind of figured out. Now, before you hit the MLS, there are two things I would recommend. Uh, if you are selling a house, please, please, please get a pre-home inspection. Now, in the city of Toronto, this is pretty standard that most homes that come to the market have a pre-home inspection already done. Uh, typical full-service realtors will pay for that for you anyways. I don't know why it is, but in other markets like in Durham and some in York region and Brampton, they don't do pre-home inspections. I don't know why I think it's silly. I think like get all the information, put it out there and make it very clear to people. Um, do this because for safety reasons, I think it's important. Uh, I would always get a pre-home inspection done. That is very, very important. Now, if you are selling a condo and the reason why as well, sorry, I was jumping ahead there. The reason why as well is because someone's interested in your property. They're going to put in an inspection clause anyways, if you don't have a pre-home inspection, unless there's like 20 offers on the property and they don't have the opportunity to, cause they're never going to win with a, with a condition. Right? So just get it done, get it done beforehand. It makes it easier for everyone throughout the process. If you're selling a condo, same thing on the status certificate. We pay for them anyways. Just order it ahead of time because at the end of the day, as a seller, what's your goal? Your goal is to sell your property, but that means your property has to be sold firm. What are the two main conditions other than a typical financing condition? On a house, it's a home inspection, right? And on a condo, it's the review of the status certificate. So do yourself a favor. Get your real estate agent to take care of this for you before you ever hit the market because it's going to get you closer to a firm offer quicker. If you're hiring an agent to sell your home, you're going to want them to ask for feedback from the showings that come through the house. Now, automatic feedback requests are typically sent. In my experience in Toronto, like 25% of people actually give feedback on the property. If someone's actually interested in the house, they're going to call me anyways and say, hey, I got questions. And you typically get a sense when they're asking specific questions like, what's your client's ideal closing date? It's like, okay, you know, they're, they're thinking of making an offer. And when you get an offer on the property, you basically have three choices, right? You can say yes, you can accept it. You can just flat out say no, or you can counter the offer back and countering the offer back might mean, hey, you actually agree with their price. You're okay with the price they offered, but you need to change the closing date by 25 days or something like that. So you're countering back to them with that change being made and then leaving it up to them to accept that offer. Or they can say no, or they could counter it back to you and go back and forth and back and forth, depending on the type of market. The, the last thing I want to talk about in today's video is open houses. Okay, so I've taken a lot of flack about this from my colleagues in real estate because I've been pretty vocal about the fact that the numbers don't suggest that open houses work as well as they used to. And I think that open houses are a wonderful marketing opportunity. And I'm saying this from an agent selling in Toronto, Ontario. So this is where my opinion is coming from. I think they're a wonderful marketing opportunity for me <laughs> I get free advertising on your street. I get to meet all your neighbors, but the National Association of Realtors statistics come out every single year. And this is all of North America. And it's usually like less than 5% of buyers are actually coming from open houses. So if you're selling your property, where are the 95% of buyers actually coming from? Private viewings with their real estate agent using a lockbox or meeting the other agent at the property. In my opinion, if I was selling my property, I'd be focusing on that. An open house isn't not gonna make your home sell, but they're not as powerful as they used to because now everyone has all the information anyways, and virtual tours are getting pretty amazing. And those two years of the pandemic we just went through kind of proved actually that open houses aren't needed to sell properties for top dollar. We keep open houses optional to our clients. If you want us to do one, we will. If you don't, you don't have to. We mostly focus on private viewings. Thank you so much. If you made it to the end of this video, like really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun recording this. I didn't take too many notes before starting this other than some bullet points of what I wanted to talk about. So I hope I didn't ramble on too much. I hope that made sense to you. I know you maybe have questions about this video and if you do, please put them below. Thank you so much for watching this. Uh, I hope that you found value in it. My name is Tom Story and remember, home is where your story begins.